I'm so excited to really be hosting uh, today's True It All because my guest is a very, very special guest. Um, of course, it's in person of KBAC um, of Olubayo Midapo, the Alara of Ara. Uh, of course, many have been asking me, how did I get to know the king? Um, just for your information, I am from Ara. Ara is a town in Osu State. All right, so that's where I'm from. And uh, my guest tonight is the king of Ara. Okay, so like we normally say, through it all, it's all about using our stories to encourage and inspire others. Um, these days, people are going through a lot of things. Uh, many just believe that, oh, things can just work again. My life can just make sense again. Um, things will just keep going from bad to worse. But some of us believe that the Bible says when others are saying there is a casting down, we belong to the category of people that we say there is a lifting up whether individually or for our nation. All right, so Street All is all about encouragement. It's all about letting people know that if some of the things that others had gone through and they had actually um, gone beyond it, have come out at the other end, if they could do that, you also can experience such. All right, and of course, the name of the title of the program is gotten from my book, Through It All. You will see it up there. Of course, Through It All is a book I wrote um, as a memoir of all the trials and then, of course, the triumphs I've gone through in life. So if um, you are interested in getting a copy, you, you can visit the website, cia.com.ng, or you can send a, a message to the number on the screen. All right, so let's go into the business of today. Um, like I said, um, I have a very, very special guest on the program today. Um, he's a person of um, KBAC, of Olubayo, Mwidapo, the Alara of Ara. All right, um, so I'm not gonna be wasting any time this Day because this journey is going to be very far. Um, so with all gladness and uh, the joy of the Lord, I welcome to the screen um, our KBAC um, of Alara of Ara. KBAC, nice to have you here. KBAC, hello to Mary. Good evening. Epoelesa, <laughs> nice to have you here, sir. <laughs> thank you, brother. And thank I, you. So okay, uh, sir. I bring everyone glad tidings from the good people of Ara. Thank you, I sir. You. Merry Christmas in advance. Hallelujah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, KBC, for um, accepting to feature on True It All. And of course, um, it was so easy for me to bring you. Um, I mean, on board because you have always followed the program. I told somebody that KBS he had the mystery it all. He said, How did I do it? I said, <laughs> It's because my KBS he must follow what all his, uh, all his people are doing. <laughs> so I, I don't take all those things for granted, KBS. Thank you so, 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 so much, sir. Uh, all right. So it, it's going to really be. Even me, I'm looking forward to hearing the, your full story tonight. Um, I've had one knee, I've had one way, but um, I'm going to hear from the real Obas mouth um, tonight. Um, number one, uh, Kabez, is it true that um, your dad was a bricklayer? I... My dad was a bricklayer and my mom was a petty trader. Wow. Wow. All right. So let's take it on from there. How, how did you end up being a medical doctor? So take us through your story, sir. Uh, 
I want to start this uh, program with two songs, if you don't mind. Go ahead, sir. And the two of them summarize my life. The first one goes like this. And the two of them summarize. I want to Tosi Amorawa. Awati ari ore ofe, awati ari anuba o, awato jo tiri to jo di ti lai lai, awato peto si amorawa. The second one is of the same, uh, is about the same thing. That's the grace of God. It goes like this. Oh, re of a oh, I do me little. Oh, bore of a so my life is about grace. I believe I had special grace from God. Starting with my childhood, I was born and raised in Ladukwam, close to Ibadan in Oyo State, in a village setting. <laughs> my dad, like I told you, was a bricklayer. My mom, a petty trader. Both of them illiterate. But my father could barely read the Bible. Now, I was born into a polygamous family. My dad had three wives. But you see, that grace was upon my life for him not to have raised so many children. Despite the fact of having three wives, he had only six of us. Wow. And incidentally, I'm the only male, the only wow. son. <laughs> and by that, you can expect that I'm going to be, or I was going to be a spoiled child. Because I can tell you right from the time when I was in secondary school, my mom and my aunties were sending girls to me for me to impregnate so that they could start having more children. <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> but let me start by telling you that I went to St. Luke Anglican School, La Lupa. Yes, and uh, even the two, uh, my two parents, they were very busy with their lives. So I was actually raised by my grandma. And you know, children raised by grandparents, they are usually spoiled. <laughs> I was actually going to be spoiled, but for the grace of God. Mm. But even at that, I still had my fair share of uh, child abuse or child uh, exploitation. That's the way they will describe it in the Western world. <laughs> Despite the fact that my grandma tried to spoil me, I was made to sell all sorts of things from yam, new yam, especially muye. You know, we call it muye, the new yam. And then my mom, my grandma was into just name it. She was a pounded yam seller, amala seller, uh, yam seller. Uh, there, then there were these things they call country in Ibadan. That's okay. Amalansi Nobe. Okay. Or <laughs> Pandemia without steel. Or Eba without steel. I was made to sell all those things. Especially grand nuts. My, my grandma sold both boiled and roasted grand nuts. And I was made to do all of this. But that was, to me, it was a lot of fun. I was just having a normal childhood experience. But with the hindsight, I knew they were all exploitation. Because uh, hardly can you find 
children who are who are ready to do all those things nowadays. Mm-hmm. In fact, when I tell my children that I did this, I did that, they will say, oh, this man can't talk because they don't believe me. Then my, my grandma had a kind of overbearing effect on the family. It was whatever she told my two parents that will be the, the final thing. And I say, <laughs> yes. But let, let me tell you some of the graces that I had as a very young child. My grandfather was a, a herbalist. And as young as I was, because I could remember things that happened when I was three years old. I would follow the man around the house as she was as he was burning one thing or the other on Jogu. I was always there to taste part of it. So if I had grown up enough, or if the man had lived long enough for me to grow, I would have been a babalao by now. <laughs> I thank God for that grace as well. Then that I knew could have had more children. My mom had just two of us till I was in form five. My elder sister, and we have about five years gap between us. And that was not the in thing then. Maybe a maximum of two years or something like that. But my mom told the story that uh, she was disturbed by this abiku or banje phenomenon that she lost so many children in between myself and my sister. But with hindsight, I remember what was probably responsible for that. In our house, there was this thing which was common in Yoruba land then. They call it egunugu. Mm. It's one horrible concussion. The, mm. the base of that concussion is a, ure, a cow's urine. Wow. Then you have all sorts of corrosives and poisonous substances like naphthalene. They call it kafura. Mm. Alpha. Of course, I've told you cow's urine is the base. Then you have uh, a root. I don't know what they call a rule in English, but it's something that is very toxic if you use it in large quantity. I think some uh, house people, they put it in the red suya pepper. And we know that red suya pepper can actually precipitate some liver problem. That's why a lot of C-class, they run into trouble with it. So this concussion contains so many horrible things. And they usually hang the thing on top of uh, just like where you have a chimney or something like that. That's where they will hang it. And the thing will be receiving constant eating. Such that when they bring it out and they open it like this, you see a kind of fume coming out of it. Even smelling that fume can make you vomit. So... That was the thing that they were using to treat any form of fever in us in those days. So when you take igunugu, reflexly, you must vomit it unless you have lost your reflex. And there were so many children that could be so sick that would have lost their reflex. Within 48 hours, such a child would die because the thing knocks off the liver and knocks off the kidney. Wow. And within hours, the child will start changing color. Usually the skin will have been yellow before the, the child eventually died. I saw all this, and I believe that those of us that survived then, we had special grace from God. So that's where my story of grace starts. For me to have survived that early childhood, and then to have lived Maybe for my grandfather to have died, I, I, I wouldn't know whether it was going to be a, a, a blessing or not, but then nowadays, who respects all these traditional abalis? Everybody wants to, to do their own thing the Western way. So I was able to go through primary school. I went 
to St. Louis Anglican School, La Lubon, where I was very tiny then. <laughs> At the age of 10, I left, I, I did the first, uh, we call it G2 in those days. I did the exam, passed it. But my grandmother, who had such an overbearing uh, a relationship with, within the family, with the family, insisted that I had to repeat primary six. Wow. For no reason other than the fact that my uncles who were well-read did it. She couldn't tell whether those ones failed their exam to cross over to secondary school or to wherever, <laughs> but she insisted that I should repeat primary six. And those, I spent two years eventually at home. Wow. Those were two turbulent years. In fact, when I refused that I was not going to repeat, my grandma said, well, if you refuse to repeat primary six, that means you are not going to school anymore. Then my, I, then my, start, my life just started drifting. I registered in an oh, Arabic God. school. You, I, I'm sure you'll be surprised. <laughs> I, in Arabic school. I did so well, so that my, uh, my, my Malib had to take me to Arabic system of Nigeria, where I wrote their exam and passed. I will have been in the same category with the likes of uh, this professor, Oloko uh, uh, and Co. Those are Muslim clerics now. Okay. And that's also in We wrote the exam together in Iliku Rode. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember one professor, Camille Olosho. We wrote the exam the same year. If you could remember, that was around 1972 in uh, Arabic Institute of Nigeria, Iliku Rode. But I, I said those two years were turbulent. Then my dad now came in, said, now that uh, you've refused to repeat. But, but even at that, I still went ahead and registered for the G2 exam for the second time, mm -hmm. which even despite the fact that I was not attending classes, I wrote and passed of it. But yet, I still did not go to school. I started following my dad to his bricklayering job. In fact, there's a building in Ibadan that we started together and finished it together. Wow. And if, if you know, if, if you are familiar with Ring Road in Ibadan, there's a place they call Shude in the, Okay. There's a building there that belongs to mom. In fact, there are a, a number of buildings, but there was one in particular that was the first one, belonged to uh, Major Shude in the, Mm -hmm. We started it. It was a turnkey project. My dad was the supervisor. I was using this my hair to carry cement. Uh -huh. <laughs> in fact, when I, I have a white patch at the center of my, my scalp. Anytime I showed it to my children that this is from the <laughs> turkey, I call it Uru Kongkong. They, they wouldn't believe, but all this I went through. So in the midst of all that, I had this my uncle, who was still a student in the University of Ibadan, may be so rest in perfect peace. He was the one that came home and saw me and said, what is going on? By that time, schools had resumed. I was just laying around, following my dad to uh, his uh, working place. But you see, let, let me relate another Grace, there was a day my, my dad was working uh, on a wall. They were setting blocks. And I sat down after fetching him cement to work with, or mortar to work with. I just sat down beside the wall. I just noticed that something was peeling from the wall. By the time I raised up my head, that wall was almost on me. On top of you, wow. But I just ran somehow and I escaped it. The bucket that was very close to me was folded into two like this. Wow. 
Wow. So I've imagined who will be talking to you. <laughs> I'm telling you, I've gone through a lot, despite the fact that I was supposed to be a spoiled child, but that was not. <laughs> then, uh, hey, you know, I, I told you the story of uh, uh, this Egunugu, the, yes, the compost, which luckily I escaped the, the, the toxic effect of. I was very, very, very sickly when I was very small. There was this quack doctor in Ladukon then, was an Igbo man. He fled Ladukon when the war started. So that man had a, a, a very queer way of treating malaria. Once you run fever, he will give you this warm expeller. We call it piperazine. I mean, I started remembering all these when I started my practice. <laughs> of course, well, right from this time I went that medical school. So that piperazine, when given, it will kill off all the roundworms in you. So the, it will give you, like, if you go there today, you take the piperazine. The following morning, you report back, they will do what we call enema. They pour warm okay. water soap into your anus, and that will flush out all the worms. So that was like a magic to me. And that was the beginning of my thoughts about going for medicine. As early as the age of, say, five, I started thinking of reading medicine. So when eventually my that my uncle came, he said, you cannot be wasting away here. I told you school had already resumed. And then he said, you can as well go to modern school. Mm. Because I was so brilliant, I joined the first modern school, SDA Romo. I spent three months there. I was able to catch up with them, with all they had done. I was not satisfied with that school. Then I moved to another modern school where I spent another three months. And then year went but during the, the, the those months my uncle got me the form to Lagilu grammar school and that was the only common entrance that i wrote that was the only exam that i wrote and by the special grace of god i was number three on the list of admission wow. so then the journey to Lagilu grammar school started in 1974, you can imagine having left secondary school in 1971 and then entering secondary school in 1971. Okay, primary school in 71. Yes. Secondary school in 1974. So, let me say something about my early childhood in Lalupon. Okay, sir. At that time, there was no, uh, the, the, for the major part of the time, there was no light in Lalupon until 1973. 1973 was the year of Naira and Kobo. Shortly after the introduction of Naira and Kobo, then they brought light to Lalupon, electricity to Lalupon. I remember those of us from the, the, the poor background who go and watch television in the houses of others. <laughs> I mean, how many of them? Maybe there were two families that owned television in Lalupon. One of them was actually a gift from Americans who came for uh, Peace Corps. You know, there were people sent from America or from other parts of the world in those days for Peace Corps. And Nigerians, Nigeria would send an uh, equal number back to those countries. Uh, I don't think we have such things anymore. Yeah, but there are some that uh, people who exploit and misbehave in the Nandis. So this man had the television. It was a, a matter of survival of the fittest. <laughs> the, 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 the strong boys will be in front, and those of us who are less endowed will be, will be stretching our necks from the back. So that was how bad the situation was. And I scaled through all that. And let me add one other grace. My father was not good at farming. 
he concentrated more on his uh, uh, on his uh, bricklaying job. But I had this uncle who was mainly a farmer. He was the one that even allowed me to know that yam is not plugged on the tree. <laughs> Otherwise, I could have been like any other butter child. <laughs> because uh, I had no, no opportunity of going to the farm. But this my uncle was there for me. But we had this farm. You know, when you have a farm that is quite distant from home, we call it Egon. We okay. had this uh, distant farm along Oduoba. There's a, a, I mean, a branch of Oduoba, about 10 kilometers away from Lalubo. Wow. What were, what were we doing? I, my dad, my uncle, had a, a son, like, who mm. we were almost in mid. He's a pastor mm. today. And uh, mm. what were we doing? We would just, uh, mm. I mean, follow him to the mm. farm. Prepare for mm. for mm. lunch or dinner or whatever, mm. and then we were mm. always there mm. to eat. Just mm. help on the farm by gathering mm. Uh, mm. whatever the man has uh, harvested mm. and things like that. Then there was this day after working for the day, then we went swimming in a uh, Oduoba. Okay. But I was swept off. I had given up that I was drowned. The, the end is going. here. Wow. The thing just came from nowhere and I held on to a shrub. Without, you, know, you know, a drowning man will hold on to just anything. Anything. And I held on to that shrub until that my uncle was able to come and lift me out of the river. I cannot forget that very incident as the first one that I knew I had a lucky escape. And since then, I've been thinking that God had a purpose for my life. Wow. So, the, the, the journey to Lagelo Grammar School started. Um, you know, like I told you, I was supposed to be a... a a, a, a spoiled child and I really was but somehow I went through other things there was nobody that I respected in those days mm. nobody including my mom I was calling my mom by her name until I was about to get into secondary school <laughs> all my uncles that were in uh, higher institutions uh, wherever they were, even even the one that was a uh, uh, Paolo Godi's uh, colleague in Central Bank, as at that time, I was calling him by his name. This way, the <laughs> only person that I respected was my dad because I saw him as a wicked person; he could kill me. Because my my dad had one ruled wire like that, which which would beat any of us that misbehaved. And of course, we were just two then. Mm. Now, when eventually I got to like the grammar school, I met some of the most brilliant, I mean, with hindsight, some of the most brilliant brains that this country has ever nurtured. If I mention oh. some of my colleagues, I mean, some of my classmates, you, you will know. But I don't need to do all that tonight. Now, okay. throughout my Lagilu days, I only came second once, and that was the first time in Lagilu Grammar School. Wow. Up to Waek, I led my class all through. But that was not to say that I was the most studious. No, I saw myself as just like any other student. I wouldn't read into the night, like, um, uh, like most bookworms, but I just had that grace. Mm. I, I was like, like my, some of my colleagues would say that uh, mm. I had a mag magnetic brain. <laughs> just the minimum that I could read was able to sustain me all through. And of course, I was made the head boy. 
that confirms, I mean, some form of uh, uh, being a leader in the class. Mm. So in Lagelu Grammar School, I was not as innocent as most of my teachers thought. <laughs> no, man, Buffet. <laughs> I was, although most of my classmates or schoolmates, they saw me as one of those, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't call myself a bad boy, but I was one of those, <laughs> they would say, Umbogba. There were parties in town that we were always attending, especially literary and debating society activities outside the school. Even when our school was not invited, we would dress up because I, I lived in the boarding house also. We would dress up without permission from anybody, go there, and of course, enjoy the after party. I was one of those boys. So the school authority was seeing me in one light. My colleagues, my schoolmates and classmates, they were seeing me as just light. somebody <laughs> enjoying the grace of being brilliant, but I was as bad as any of them. <laughs> and that was the way I lived throughout like Yellow Grammar School. But I knew what my family expected of me. So I was not really as bad as maybe what some of those things we did in school. Because, and that was what informed my own opinion of sending all my children to body house. There they will learn the good, the bad, and the ugly. But mm. at school, you will see all those things and give them, put them in the way of the Lord. Yeah. So I left Lagelu Grammar School for medical school. I, I went to College of Medicine, University of Lagos. Then I had a year of a level at Federal Government College in Lorry, yes, where I met so many uh, bad boys and good ones. Uh, it's so funny that I met the likes of Yupili, that was uh, uh, executed for armed robbery in Federal wow. Government College in Lorry. And there I met the likes of Donald Duke, too, who was my junior. Wow. It was in Federal Government College that I started having a good feel of ARA as my uh, ancestral home. Because there I met uh, late Mr. Adewolu. He was okay. one of our house masters. And he was actually the one that was always asking me about ARA because he knew some of my uncles. But I was always smiling because I wouldn't know what to tell him. <laughs> As at that time, maybe I had never been to Ara self. In fact, I, I came to Ara on my own when I was in medical school for the first time. So I went through medical school. I was a student activist. I was uh, in the Student Representative Council at College of, at the University of Lagos. And I was in the Medical Student Association in the College of Medicine itself. Then, in my final year, I became the class captain. And uh, to the glory of God today, the yearbook that my set produced is still the best. And of course, what others are trailing today in the College of Medicine, University of Lagos. Wow. So I, I, I enjoyed my student life as if in fact, I was living even at that time as if I was the son of an aristocrat because I had my uncles who were ready to spoil me. Wow. God gave me that grace of being brilliant. They never found me wanting in my studies. So just let me ask for anything. They, are ready they would to just need to, to, to supply. Then, you know, I, I said the gap between me and my elder sister was about five years. So yeah. at the time I was even in secondary school, my sister was already a nurse. So you, you could see what happened. <laughs> now, 
let me go to the story of my uh, practice. I graduated in the year 1986. Funny enough, God actually wanted to be speaking to me when I was growing older to realize that that grace that I have, I must not misuse it. So that was my final year in medical school was the first sign of God speaking to me. Wow. Because in our fourth year, there was this final exam that once you pass that exam, you have already become a doctor. So the real, the final year were mainly courses that could be taken as walkover, that could be taken for granted. But as God will have it, have it, I, I repeated, I had to repeat one of the courses. I had a receipt in general medical practice, which wow. we all took for granted. It was <laughs> not anything more than maybe what most students take for general knowledge in uh, university. So I failed it. I could not fathom how it came. And I knew it was God speaking to me. And that made me to lose an opportunity of house job where I chose to do it. Wow. I actually chose to do my house job in the uh, Baptist Medical Center of Okay, sir. By the time I got there, they told me that they, they had filled their quota. Usually they take four, four candidates every year. So by the time I got there, they had taken the four. But my spirit was just telling me that this is where you will start a good life. Don't, don't go for anything less. I had a cousin, and he's still there, my Dr. Ajiboye. He has one of the biggest private practices in the Bumosha. That is the okay. Retiuli okay. Hospital. Okay. So I approached him, and he said, if you are ready to stay, we can work out the possibility of you not taking salary from them. And then you will now become a supernumerary assistant. And we approached the, the hospital authority and they agreed. Wow. So that was how I spent a year without taking Kobo as salary. I only wow. lived on my call duty allowances. And uh, I had that grace again that my big sister, okay. when she was traveling abroad, left me a brand new Volkswagen. Mm. And I did not really suffer anything because what most of my colleagues will be striving to get was to have a car in that first year of practice. I had it. So what have I got to lose? But the, the gains of that mm. year mm. is still what I'm living on to today in medical practice. Mm. Because Ogumo Shaw So I, I stayed there. I spent that one year, spent another year of youth service with the Nigerian army. I lived a very good life because most of the skills that I, I acquired from house job, as a house officer, I was good enough to do most life-saving surgeries, including cesarean operation, some wow. abdominal wow. surgeries. Yes, even as at that time. So I was a hot cake in Lagos. Mm -hmm. People were calling me here and there to come and do surgery for them. I made so much money. By the time I finished my, my youth service, I had so much money to even say, okay, let me get married. I could even finance my own wedding on my own. Wow. Now, <laughs> I eventually, I started a private practice along with my, I, I first of all started the, the 
residency training program in orthopedic surgery at National Orthopedic Hospital Ubomoji. At National Orthopedic Hospital Ibobi. But before then, I had spent like six months with Dr. Awujobi in Ubomoji. I had that unique opportunity of being with Dr. Awujobi. And that was, that was another grace that, that I always remember. Dr. Awujobi taught me the best rubrics of surgery and then the survivor in a private practice within that short time. He was the one that actually taught me that as a doctor, you need bricks. Otherwise, one could just collapse and die like that. And since, that, since the time I spent with him, I had cultivated the habit of taking breaks every six, six months, even if it be one week, of just staying away from my practice and living free. So I started my private practice along with my, my residency training program. But as God will have it, residency training was rather impoverishing. So I, at a point, we were having so many uh, so many strikes. And then by the time I was about to write in my part one, I settled into my private practice and that was it. So there was this other grace that I had that I did not realize in Shomolu in my private practice. People will come because I started making it big. Within a few years, I was able to build my own hospital, fairly well equipped, that is standing there in Bariga today as additional clinic. People will come and ask me, what cult do you belong to? What secrecy <laughs> do you belong to? Even some of my very close friends, I would just smile and just brush it aside. There was even this, my friend, that came to my practice one day and saw a, a small heap of sand at the doorstep to enter the hospital. You know, this <laughs> my, cleaners, my cleaners were very lazy. Once they remove the dirt, they will leave the sand apart. They, <laughs> they start the sand to build up. So there was my friend who came and said, All right, please lead me into the secret now. How are you making it? Some even thought I was carrying cocaine because I would travel almost every six months abroad to go and relax with my family. So some people thought I was a cocaine pusher. <laughs> <laughs> so this my friend now approached me and said, the, even if it's just part of the sand at the entrance. <laughs> <laughs> he believed it was something. <laughs> all right, if you need all that, please gather everything. <laughs> By the time you come back in another one month, you will have more than that. <laughs> because I knew how this was clean as well. That was how I But Dr. Awojobi, may, may his soul rest in perfect peace, had taught me that the only secret of a doctor is to believe in God and nothing but God. Wow. Because after God, we have the secret of life. We know some of those things that can snuff life out of anybody. And God also endowed us with that, that knowledge that we should be able to save lives, even at the even almost at the point of death. So I started living on that all along. And that was how I was able to. In fact, there was this story of another man who was the leader of a cult in Shomolu. He brought his uh, son's wife one afternoon like that and was shouting before even entering the hospital. Adeshola, Omodwagba, Awangba, Onibonyo, Tawubagba, Onibonyo, Awafaya. 
Mami, oh, I'm very dumb, you will. <laughs> and of course, Dr. Wojod B had taught me how to play on such people's psychology. I told him to come in, Baba, bring the problem. Whatever <laughs> it is, I defy. We will consult the oracle and we will solve it. The man brought in the lady. Was The lady was already exhausted, having pushed and pushed and could not make getting out the baby. I told my people to wheel the, the lady into the theater. And of course, within a few minutes, we got out the baby. I came out to tell the man that, Baba, I have consulted <laughs> the oracle and the oracle has given me the, the solution. And that was surgery. Mm -hmm. All the people that are, that are involved in that havoc, they will come and beg you because I've removed their hands with my knife. <laughs> they beg you, then they will remain amputated for life. The man started rolling around. He came in his uh, uh, cult attire with uh, Pariko or whatever they call it. And he was rolling on the ground. And I told him, Baba, I will be on the I will let you go. Don't worry, Baba. That one has been done. And our creation, have, uh, they have accepted it. That was how I was able to survive in Shomolu. And Shomolu is full of all sorts of pranks all sort of trouble, all sort yeah, of right. I survived it through the grace of God. Now, so that I don't waste so much time. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't believe I'm wasting time because, but if I continue to reel out. No, 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 it's, we, are, we are actually learning so much. And the yes. one thing I found out from everything you've said, you kept on mentioning grace, 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 grace. grace. and grace. So, so obviously, you know, many also, um, they enjoy that grace of God, right. but they don't acknowledge the one that gives them the grace. Some will not acknowledge it because they, they don't even see it as enjoying the grace. That's mm. the much. Yes. Mm. Because I, I saw it as grace because a lot of children or a lot of little kids that we attended primary school together, when I see them nowadays, they look like my grandfather. Wow. So I know I just had that grace. I know a number of my classmates in secondary school that, was, uh, that, that, that were as brilliant, if not even more brilliant, but then they ended up in the secretariat without mm. ordering their education. Mm. So it's not for the grace of God. Mm. Now, I, I did mention it, that I enjoyed scholarships, many yeah. of them, through secondary school. I had state government. I had uh, two private scholarships. Ogun Shola Foundation was one of them. And I can't even remember the other one. I even had scholarship to go and study engineering in the uh, University of uh, uh, Chicago, the Urbana Champaign campus. It was one of my uncles who dissuaded me that you better don't because such scholarships may not actually pay off. Mm. Then, I had always thought of medicine even before that. I, mm. That my cousin that eventually took me on in Ogumo Show, Dr. Ajiboye, was, yes. was an inspiration for me. He had aggregate six in those days, in wow. the year 1970, in the same Lagilu School that I went to. In fact, it was my source of inspiration also. Now, let's go to the business of how I got to this. Yes, I was going to say, so let's, how, how yes. did you move from um, yes. medicine to the throne? To, to, from, from medic to, to monarchy. <laughs> <laughs> now, you see, even as a little child, with my belief in this grace, I started believing the song of one of our artists that a week on Lijabo, and that is that 
there's nothing that happens by accident. Everything is predestined, preordained. Mm. My coming to the throne, I believe and very strongly too that it was preordained, predestined. I remember one day, as a little child, we were playing on the, I mean, on an open space where rainwater passes. We were playing, we were constructing small houses with the sand. Mm -hmm. And there was this man that passed by us. After passing by, he came back again, looked at me, and went to somewhere where our parents were sitting down and they were just in. And asked, my mom was one of the people there, and asked for whoever my parents were. The man pointed at me in particular. We were more than six children playing in the sand. And my mom asked to know what the problem was. And the man said, that's your little child. Please treat him as somebody very important. Don't scold him. Don't ever make him sad in any way. And don't beat him on the head. Because he called me, he called me so that they would, they would that my mom will know that I was the one I was talking about. So I had all those things. Mm. And they still ring in my head, even up to today. Mm. But not until, like I said, not until 1985, when I was going for external posting in Ogumosho, that I first of all put my feet on the sand of Ara. Sir? We were going for external posting in Ogumosho, then we, we boarded the public transport. Those of us who were going, we were like five. And then I asked the bus to stop that I wanted to buy something. And I think I bought biscuit or something just to make sure I stopped. I mean, I stepped on the sand of Ara. I now told my colleagues that this is my ancestral home. I only grew up in Lalupong, stroke Ibadan. And that was my first time. And then by the time I started my house job and I was passing, I was I, I used to pass through Ara to go to Ibadan or Lagos. Then sometime in 19, I think it was 1994 or 1995, my father took a chieftain city to in Lalupon and invited yeah. because all along my my parents were coming, they, they were always coming to Ara, one thing or the other, especially for the Alami festival. So my father now invited the then Alara late uh, uh, Baba Omolawi. So when he came, he said he came not to come and feast on whatever my father was going to provide, but he was, he was there to make a point that we oh, are oh. princes from Ara. So it was wrong for my dad to pick a chieftain's title in Alubon. That the mm. crown is waiting for us in Ara. Because I was called to come and pacify Baba Alara that because he was not ready to, to take anything and he was not ready to drink anything. I had to go. I prostrated and told Baba to please forgive my dad that maybe he did not know that it was wrong for a prince because my dad knew he was a prince, but he probably did not see it as anything because he had lived all his life in Nagumon, was hmm. mainly more of a visitor to Ara. So the man eventually accepted and my dad introduced me to him as a Omo Yeo in the future. And that was how that one went. And my father, because later I asked my dad, what was the meaning of what the man was saying? My dad now told me 
that the man was telling us that after him, it is our family, mm-hmm. it is our own ruling house that we come on the throne. That time, that did not stimulate my interest. Although as a little child, anytime I saw the Bali of Laluko being escorted with the with, uh, uh, flute or whatever and uh, drums, mm-hmm. it was always fascinating to me. And I wanted to be a king too, but then, that was then. So when my father died in 2012, my uncle, and before he died, he told me that I should not be far away from Ara. So there that, that was this my uncle who was next in command to my dad. Mm-hmm. They were always coming to Ara together. And in fact, when they wanted to build a house, I, I and my other uh, colleagues in the family, we, we contributed quite some amount of money to the project. Mm-hmm. So that my uncle now said, your dad told you something about Ara. Why don't you join me in attending the meeting? So I came for that family meeting for the first time in 2013 Easter. And when I landed, there were these old women, three of them that I was introduced to. And they all told me, they were all calling me Ulu Yede, Omowale. Two of them in particular told me that I should not be afraid of anything, you know, that we have a major assignment ahead of us, but I did not understand. As at that time, the case of uh, Alara versus somebody who was trying to intrude was in court then. Mm-hmm. And the, 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 the case eventually ran till 2018. And in fact, to 2019, January, when the court eventually ruled that our community can pick a king. Okay, sir. So, since 2013, I had been coming to Ara mm-hmm. to hold meetings, to be part of the family. And there was no meeting at the end of every month that I missed. Mm-hmm. And in fact, we had a family meeting in December where we had a big party that I actually boosted along with my uncle. Um, Papa Olubodi came there for another purpose, not for the purpose of the party. He came to pick his, uh, uh, his driver, who happened to be one of my nephews. But he sat down quietly and was enjoying all the talks we were having. When he now heard my name, that Windapo, Papa now called me aside. He said, which Windapo is your own? And I said, the only Windapo in the universe. <laughs> I've not heard of any other Windapo elsewhere. But I said, is one Adesoye, your father or who? I said, that's my uncle, the one that is actually next to my dad. That was my colleague in the central bank. I said he's still alive and is there. He's a, he's a retiree too. Okay. Papa kept quiet. And at a point, Baba told the family that he wanted to address them. That you, Iraye, chieftaincy, family people, what are you looking at? You have a son who is the medical doctor. And you cannot pick him as the one to be the king. What are you waiting for? As at that time, this case was still in court. Yes. And we don't even know where we were going. But that was how Papa predicted my ascendancy to the throne. Nobody gave a definite answer, but then they all saw a lot of sense in what Papa said. Because Papa told them that. The reigning king in uh, Iraq, Berry, where Papa is a uh, is a Okolomo there, is a is a chief, is a medical doctor and ENT surgeon for that matter, mm-hmm. and that was one where that one ended. Then 
later the race to the throne started. Where God actually wanted to show me that my ascendancy to the throne was predestined. And that issue, the glory of it, it was not ready to show to, to, to share it with anybody. Wow. Just before the court case, I mean, the, the court judgment was pronounced in the year 2018. All the elderly people in my family, especially my own side of Ajadi ruling house, they died one after the other. Four of them. The three women who were supposed to be my backbone, who could tell the story of Ara from A to Z, who are like, who are like encyclopedia, they all died. Then that my uncle, who was feared by everybody in the family as uh, someone that, that is of uh, some power <laughs> that they alluded to him, also died. So I was now like an orphan. But something kept telling me, and even as a as a secondary school student, I had always had this feeling, this belief that with that mm -hmm. grace of God that I'm enjoying, giving equal opportunity, whatever anybody can achieve, I can equally achieve. Exactly. I'd always had that feeling, that belief, and that conviction that with this grace of God that I'm enjoying, that was there. So even being uh, 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 an orphan did not move me a second. Because I saw my choice by the few um, kingmakers that were there at that time who chose me to come to the throne and installed me on the 28th of January. The court case, I mean, the, 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 the judgment was pronounced on the 10th. No, sorry, was it? No, on the 23rd, 23rd of January. Yeah, 23rd, yes. Of January, 2019. So by 28th, Monday 28th, I was, I was installed as the Alara. But there were a lot of political intrigues, a lot of hanky-panky here and there, to the extent that some political heavyweights in Ara, who I consider as very light and almost insignificant within me, and by my own conviction, they said I will be the Alara over their dead body. And I'm wondering why they are not dead now. <laughs> so they said they would rather die than have me on the throne. They went, they, they went and convinced the governor that our people had not followed due process. And before my installation, I had asked an SEN, a friend of mine who is an SEN, a senior lawyer, that my people said I should come and be installed. And we have not gotten the approval of the government. They say, please go. Go if they want you. Because if they are the ones that have the authority, government is just to be good the consent. Go. Mm. And I went. And they installed me. But those political, so-called political heavyweights, they went and told the governor that these people have uh, uh, committed a crime. They started pulling me here and there. They pulled me up and down. Mm. Then my people started getting worried. They went on air and pronounced me uh, uh, that I should start, I should stop parading myself as the Alara. But since my people have pronounced me the Alara, and God has accepted it, 
who we say I have not Alara. And that was the way I carried oh, myself all through. But mm. man, government was not giving the accent on time. Those political heavyweights, they were pulling their own buttons. They were, I mean, they were pulling their own buttons. They were pulling their own strings. I was not moved an inch. My people were getting worried to the extent that they started consulting all sorts of oracles. I was just, I was just there unmoved. There was this my cousin who insisted that ah, this thing needs some uh, um, spiritual. Uh, attention. I said, what sort of spiritual attention? I said, ah, we, we need to see if, uh, before then, even the kingmakers, they were getting jittery because petitions started flying here and there. We were at the SCID, that's the police headquarters on more than three occasions and we survived all because we told them that we had done the traditional aspect while we are waiting for governor's consent. And nothing stops us from doing the traditional aspect of, uh, of, of uh, chieftaincy and installation of the Alara. That was how we carried on. Mm. But my people were asking me, go and see this uh, Kabiesi, go and see this person, go and see Oni, go and see all that. I saw all those ones as just belaboring the issue. Because no Ara stands on its own. It's an ancient town. We have our own, we have our own statutes. We have a declaration regarding chieftaincy. I knew all this. I was not moved. And again, my, my belief in that grace started being reinforced somehow because mm -hmm. I just saw it. Exodus 33 verse 19 kept coming to my mind all the time that God is a merciful God, is a gracious God, and he has promised to be gracious unto those who will be gracious and merciful unto those who will be merciful. So I was not moved. The funny aspect of all this worries got to that extent that one of my uncles in town here in Nara said, ah, I think we need to appease Ogun, the god of Ayo. I said, ah, ah, what has Ogun got to do in this? <laughs> the man said, ah, no. Uh, I said, well, if you want to appease to Ogun, I will not be part of that. But if you need my assistance, so that, because I wanted to be careful at the same time, I didn't want them to be saying this a lack of way. Uh, it's here to, 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 to confuse us. It's here to do all sorts of things. I said, well, go ahead. If you think you need money from me, let me know. But even at that, let me see your, your estimate. He wrote a long list of items, <laughs> including white cloth, um, uh, the, 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 the dog that will be sacrificed, uh, loads of uh, agiji, eko, <laughs> uh, ikuru. And then to cap it all, no, he mentioned magi and all sort of things. That they in and then to cap it all, he now wrote a carton of trophy lager. Ah, ah. <laughs> <laughs> that was when I, apart from Pan Wino, know, that was when I started laughing. And so, Ogu has uh, gone digital. Ogun yeah, same job. <laughs> apart from Pan Wine, I just told the beast. I didn't mention, I didn't say anything about it. And that was the end of that. <laughs> and when I acceded to one funny request by one of my cousins, not even in Ara, is my maternal cousin in Alupo. And he said, ah, there's one of the KBACs in uh, Oshun there, that is Anoba. And he knows how to 
do some abracadabra. Let's go and see him for whatever it is worth. I resisted it, but this guy would not let me rest. Eventually, I agreed to go. When, when we went, he said the man had a party overnight and was sleeping. <laughs> after, sitting down, after sitting down for two hours, I said, God, this punishment <laughs> you know, that I have acceded to this funny request is a, I mean, that by sitting down here, seeing all sorts of riffraffs passing in front of me is enough punishment. I'm an oba by my own right. Let me go. I just told my cousin I was leaving. Then, just for me to realize that I had done something wrong and God was ready to apportion that punishment, we went through one funny route like that. And my car got stuck in the river. By the time we brought it out, we had lost all the blades of the, the, the fan. We took an overheated car to our that evening. I remember, I mean, I knew how much it cost me to fix that car back. And I actually went on my knees to beg for forgiveness for breaking that my belief for those few hours. Hallelujah. And since then, I went back into my belief. I kept my faith with God. At a point, I adopted some 35 that this God, I mean, this fight is not mine alone. I kept appealing to God to fight on my side. Mm. And of course, by the end, by the time the battle was over, I, I, I realized that I have something to, to pay back. And that is the, 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 the covenant that I make in verse 18 of that Psalm 35, that mm. I will always bear witness of all that I went through with this battle. And about two weeks to when the government was going to give me my certificate of appointment, even those people that I've always been talking to that were living in the, with me in the palace. They now called me one evening like that, that they have something very important to discuss with me. I thought they had some financial issues, which was the normal thing that we were always discussing. They now said, this house in which we were living, you know, when you become an oba, you first of all live in one house before you eventually move into the palace. But because those uh, high and mighty, in quotes, of Ara, they locked the palace. Mm -hmm. And of course, because I had no cause to fight them until government gives me the power. So we were still living in that same place. They now concluded that our house was harboring some spirits that were making my ascension to the throne very difficult. <laughs> Only Elaine Egba body. Uh. <laughs> that we needed to move. A body. A house in which I had lived for over eight months. I have not fallen sick for a second. I have not had cause to have any issue with my family. With my finances, no, I'm not going to leave this house mm -hmm. until I move to the palace. Mm -hmm. I'll be moving to the palace from this house. Yeah. So I told them. Two weeks after that meeting, the governor invited me to come and pick my letter of appointment. Hallelujah. <laughs> to the glory of God, I did not have to do anything out mm. of ordinary. I moved around to see people who could be of help. Yes, 
Of course, God will not come from heaven to come and sort out those things that human beings can sort. Mm. And I had the support of some well-meaning politicians, especially the honorable in my town here, Biroba. I had the support of the state SSG, that's the Secretary to the State Government, and a few others like that. To the glory of God, that was how my conviction in that special grace of God and that faith in God still be through to the throne. Hallelujah. Thank you very much. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> God be Hallelujah. I, I, I love I love that um, Exodus, you know, that I was talking about. He says, I will also do this these things that you are spoken for. Yeah. Um, okay. Exodus 19. All right. It says Exodus 33, 19, verse 19. 33, 19. He says, yeah. then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Yes. Hallelujah. Obviously, um, it wasn't even um, in the matter of the throne that God started having compassion. I mean, oh, God yes. started being gracious. Yes, on, on right you. from my infancy. <laughs> so obviously, God knew where he was taking you yes. in the future. And um, of course, you are there now by his grace. And his grace was sufficient for you. Oh, His grace yeah. kept, kept, uh, kept keeping you going. Hallelujah. So that, that um, Psalm uh, 35, 18. Yes. Yes. How has it been playing out? You said you mentioned yes. it in passing. Yes. Since I got to the throne, in fact, my when I went to the church to do Thanksgiving and I ruled at the altar, a lot of people were wondering, how can a kid, a cabbie, a cabbie be rolling on the floor with all the paparazzi and all the gadgets on him? <laughs> they, they did not know what covenant I had with God. And then I have set out an altar in the palace where we worship God on a daily basis. Not only that, that verse 18 says I'll be praising God at every opportunity. I'm and I've started, and I've started a ministry that I call Alara Praise Ministry. Hmm. And we have started. Hallelujah. We have started an annual program that we call Jeki Oba Nyoba Nwoba let the king praise the king of kings yes. in the king's palace. Hallelujah. We have started that. Yeah. And our ministry is not just going to be our own yeah. modes of praises. We are trying to support all forms of exercise that is yeah. praising yeah. God. We want to be sponsoring uh, uh, musical outfits that are praising God. We want to be supporting them with equipment, with uh, when they have uh, uh, outreaches, we want to be supporting. Hallelujah. That is part of the mission of Alara Priest Ministry. Hallelujah. Wow. Um, I'm trying to read. Uh, Daniel chapter 2, verse 20. Um, it says, um, okay, I think it's verse 21. It says, all right, let me start from verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of the God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changed times and seasons. He removed kings 
and seated up kings. He giveth oh, yes. wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. Of course, it's the one that um, removed kings, oh, and yes. then the one that set it another king. Yes. Uh, sincerely speaking, uh, your story had been an inspiration, sir. And we can, it was obvious that God was involved, um, the way everything went. And, um, you know, the, what, what um, delights me most is the fact that um, you, you gave the, the glory to God, you still give it to him, and All you keep time. acknowledging the fact that he's the one that can actually um, enthrone a king. The king, yes, is the yeah. only one. All right, only so, one. so of course, I can only pray that God's wisdom and knowledge and his understanding will always be there for you. Amen. So always know how to rule um, and reign over the people of Ara in a way that many years to come after you would have gone to um, to the to heaven, <laughs> you know, um, they would keep talking about the things you are doing. Because uh, of course I. I, I want to confirm from you, sir. I know you confer, you com, converted the town hall to a medical rhapsody thing. Do you want to talk about that, sir? Um, the town hall we have used on a few occasions for medical outreaches. We that was even before I became the Alara. I came with my team from Lagos to do blood pressure check, checking their urine, blood, rule out uh, hypertension, rule out diabetes, and other deadly diseases. And we were giving out drugs free, free of charge, and then giving them insecticide treated nets. We did that on three occasions. But, <clears throat> excuse me, when I got to Ara. I found out that we don't have, <coughs> my throat is getting dry. <laughs> I found out that we don't have a private practice. That I think I, you should take, you can take what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just clear it. All right, sir. I found out that we don't have a private practice that is of good standard. So I, I rented a place to start a practice. And that is the building you will find on your left as you are entering Ara as, a, yeah. as a Royal Medical Center. The yeah. hall is still there for our use or other things. But the medical outfit is there and there is more of a charity thing because I found out that a lot of quacks in town are just killing our people. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have a lot of quacks in town and I've held meetings with them that uh, now that we, that God has brought me here, we have to know their limits and, mm. I, and I believe they are keeping to it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Thank you so much, KBC. I'm going to um, do open mic now. Um, I know time is gone, but this is a special edition. Um, okay. So I'll just give like um, just two persons the opportunity um, to either ask a KBC question or is it um, any commendation, anything that you want to say? Just two persons. Um, so if you are, uh, if you want to say anything, please just signify by raising up your hand, and I, I'll see it and I'll bring you up. Ah, all right. Um, okay. So I have two, uh, Bro Victor Odunsi, and then um, Adebi um, Samuel. Sorry, 
All right, so, uh, Bro Victor, let me bring you up first. Uh, Kabiesi, uh, good evening, sir. Kabiesi, hello, Jumari. Good evening, so I met you uh, for the first time when you came to the U.S. Uh, earlier this year, and I think I introduced myself to you on this forum as well. Um, so the setting in which I met you did not really afford me an opportunity to know really what you stand for. But the more that I learned from a mutual friend uh, about you, uh, the more respect I have for your industry. Uh, I want to commend your medical outreach to not only the people of Ara, but to people as far away as Oshobo and the neighboring uh, towns who also enjoy part of what you do. Uh, it is really very commendable because um, most times what you see is uh, people always asking for, for other people to come and do something for them. But what you are doing in return is actually giving back to all the people without asking for anything back in return. Uh, a shake on you. And I do have um, Aki Olajide with me as well, who would... Uh... Ah, my chairman. How is you? How is you, Lundi My chairman. How are you doing? Um, I'm so honored. Actually, I had to drive from Virginia to be here with Victor for this session, because when he told me what uh, Mr. Lugo did, um, I planned for today, I said, it would be a great honor for me to actually celebrate a friend and um, a, I'll call him a blessing to his generation. Exactly. Um, not only his generation, to your people in Ara. We can confidently tell you that what you are carrying is something big. And um, I pray to God that God will continue to um, embolden him and enlighten okay. his people to actually see the, uh, the grace that's upon the people of Ara. Because you had mentioned something, which is the grace. I tell you what, this man has been a blessing to me and so many of our friends who are doing great things both here in diaspora and in Nigeria as a country. And um, for him to have sacrificed his time, all to back up his belief and um, what God has preordained for him to be in Hara, I think it's a blessing. And um, what made America great is people building their grassroots, which is the interland. Is the only way Nigeria can be great is for people like him to go and build from inside out. Instead exactly. of focusing on the main cities, let us grow from where we are born. And you know what? He did not realize that until he got to medical school, if I understand, that he has to do this. It's a call for duty. Exactly. So, uh, you will continue to lead your people, all right? Yeah. And the grace of God will not depart from you or your Amen. life or your domain. Amen. And I uh, wish you the very best. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. Thank you so much, my brothers. Thank you so, so much. Um, okay, uh, Mr. Debi, I'm not sure that it's Mr. or Chief. Sorry, pardon me if I got it wrong. Yeah. Okay. All right, you can go. Ahead. You are you are muted. Release your mic. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening, uh, your, your Highness, sir. I pray that we have been enjoying your reign in Nara, and we will continue to enjoy it to, to the end. I pray for grace to 
fulfill your destiny and your coming to Allah in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, sir, what the question I want to ask is just that. With the grace, with the privilege you have to enjoy the grace from, from the beginning, from the beginning, from your childhood up to this moment, sir. There are many people around like that, like that, like that of your family that and the less privileged ones are not enjoying that same grace. And this has make it be very difficult for them to achieve their dream like you, like you achieve your dream, your own, sir. So sir, how can you advise, what advice can you give to us that we are less privileged in, in to save the, the, the kind of assistance we need to achieve our aim and objective in life so that we became we will become what God really wants us to be so that we will not fail our destiny, sir. Thank you, sir. May God Thank you. bless your reign, sir. Thank you, Mr. Adebi. I think I should yeah. give a response. Yes, sir. Uh, let me first of all start with my brother, uh, Mr. Victor Ducey. I want to thank you for those compliments and my chairman too. Uh, you see, when we, when boys gather together, we, we all have different views and uh, about life and issues. But well, I, I, I thank God that I'm enjoying the company of people like uh, my chairman, uh, Mr. Victor Dusi, who share the passion of making life as comfortable as possible for people. Uh, I thank God for meeting people like that. Uh, my, I, I tell anybody that cares to listen that my being here is just an extension of what I went into Rotary for. And that is, you see, at a point in life, you get to that point when you feel you have taken so much, God has blessed you with so much, and you must not only, because if you say you are giving to God, that is putting things in the church, even the society too needs you. Don't say you pay your tithe, you do this for the church. You must give back to this society too. And that was why I joined Rotary for kind of uh, structured giving. And then my practice in Bariga has been part of giving back to the society. Because, uh, you know, living among the Jebu people, you cannot but be ready to make a lot of sacrifices. Uh, my practice is not in Victoria Island, it's not in the Keja, but among the down trodden, that is a rural area of Lagos. Bariga is, uh, is a part of uh, urban slum of Lagos, and that's where I pitch my tent. So having done so much in that area, what stops me from replicating what I've done in Bariga in my own home? So I tell anybody that cares to listen that Lagos, Bariga, and Rotary have prepared me for this assignment. And God has given me the grace to do it. And I will carry it with all the strength that I have. And I will carry it and do it to the glory of God. And again, you see, uh, for, for me, I see that doing all those things, they are like giving me a lot of joy. You see, giving has a psychological effect. Not only psychological, they are kind of physical too, or, or, or physiological. Because when you give, or when you do something to put a smile on somebody's face, mm. 
gives you an inner joy that you cannot value. It's true, sir. And that is what I enjoy in being here. My young one, because I, I think I can figure out what Mr. Adibi is trying to say. You see, in Ara, I discovered that those three problems of the third world, they are very ripe here. Poverty, diseases, and ignorance. Mm. They are very ripe here. And one of the problems that has arisen from poverty is that if you have only one person that has broken even in your family, the demand is so much on him. At a point, if he doesn't have the grace and he doesn't have the spirit of giving, because uh, like I always tell people, Mother Teresa enjoined us to give until it pains. Mm. Until it pains. That is when you really feel that you are giving. But a lot of people don't, they don't want to wait like that. Some people have the feeling that if you give to the poor too much, you will become one of them. It's a lie. Yeah. Unless, <laughs> unless you are not giving with your, with your heart. Because exactly. the more you give, the more the blessing you get. And that's what I believe in. But from where your, I mean, Mr. Abayomi is coming from in terms of what he presented to us, a lot of people in Ara are tired of family requesting for one thing or the other from them. I, I am using this medium to appeal to those of them that can hear me, not to relent, not to get tired, and just believe that the more you give, the more blessing you get. Exactly. And for people of Mr. Adebi's uh, class or thoughts or whatever, I believe what will be, will be. If at my own level, Because when I started growing up, I did not know there was any uncle until I got out of primary school. But God was there for me. And he's still there for me till today. Hallelujah. If you have that faith and you believe in that maxim that what we be, we be. You have no cause to see anybody as not helping. You do not even know what problem that other person has. You have to know that the rich also cry. So true, sir. Yes, because a lot of people in Nara, true to what he believes, he say, for what all they have done in the past, what have they gotten in return? Mm -hmm. And I tell them, you are not doing it for gain, for material gain, for anything in return. Doing it, you are doing it for God. And if exactly. you keep doing it for God, I know your reward will not only be waiting for you in heaven, you will get it before you leave this earth. Exactly. So let's just leave it like that. What will be, will be. And I appeal to those who feel that they should, I mean, they have done so much and they have not gotten anything in return. So they want to relent. No. Just think of the, the inner satisfaction that you will get from putting a smile on somebody's face and seeing somebody grow and referring to you, making an impact in somebody's life. That's me. Thank you so much, Kabiesi. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for all this wealth of um, experience that you have shared with us. Um, Sincerely speaking, I'm, I'm so honored tonight. And um, I, I know what, what you have done for us in ARA, more especially we um, in the genes of ARA, is that you have actually blazed the trail. Um, like you were 
you jokingly said uh, at a time, you know, there is that big fear that in Nara, ah, they are witches or oh, they are diesel. Oh. Don't and mind you them. Said, <laughs> so you said all the witches no more drink blood. Now they drink Zobo. <laughs> yes. yes, they're all taking Zobo now. <laughs> Which is sweeter for them. <laughs> yes, sweeter. And more enjoyable. All right. Uh, so so I, I know it's it's for any ARA indigen hearing um, this uh, program tonight and that we yet hear it or listen to it, including myself. Of course, we can only pledge our support to you, sir, and uh, to see what we can all do to make ARA great. You know, we know we know the we know ARA has that potential and we know we have very great people um all over the place you know um but there was no enabling environment in in that place that's why nobody wants to plow back before now but i know you've been there um it's you you are really making things so easy for us to say all right let's go back home and see what we can do for um like what adebi said people that really need um, assistance of course, not in terms of money. It's in terms of doing, creating what we bring money to them. It that does not work, you not expect food. You must work. So we we'll see what to do to do to that. So thank you so much, Kabiye. See, there is one person that I also wanted to talk. I think she will be the last one, and then our cuckoo maker make the vote of thanks. Uh, Sister Fadeke, you raised your hand the other time. So let me make you talk now. <laughs> Incidentally, sir, I mistakenly raised my hand, but at the same time, it's okay. Um, <laughs> I, I'm so happy, uh, and I wish I could, I could be an indigenous of uh, era with this it's kind of conversation. <laughs> 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 with this kind of caveats God has blessed you with. I really thank God for you, sir. Thank God for your spirit. Thank God for your commitment. Thank God for you for being a person that has a mind for God, even as you are leading the people of God. I pray that the grace of God will be multiplied unto you more and more, sir. Amen. And that uh, You'll be growing in that grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. I'm really Amen. blessed listening to you. I'm so encouraged that we still have communities like this. We thank God for you. Amen. God bless you. you. Amen. 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 All right. Um, I, I, I think we should just uh, we should let you. We should release you from this point. Thank you so much for uh, Kavyesi. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, really, good. Good. really so much. Really Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. <laughs> Thank you, the contingent from US. Uh, Bye -bye to everybody. Yes, Victor. Don't uh, don't say we happen to be classmates in Baptist Academy. Oh, 1977. Even though I left at a point for Baptist High School like there, okay, we, we reunited again, and uh, we thank God for what is doing. Well, actually, this, well, actually, don't worry.
adoption. Uh, adoption. Okay, that's good. That's good. And uh, Mr. Thank, Lucas, you. thank you so much for putting this together. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. And thank um, you. I can tell you, confidently tell you, on behalf of me and my other friends, which KBSC will tell you in uh, offline, <laughs> we, we have something big coming to Ara, like Borolong. Hallelujah. Thank you so, so much. I'm so grateful. Yeah, we are so grateful. Yeah. All right. Gabi is here. She's gone inside. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, everyone, thank you for waiting up to this time. Today is a, um, is a special edition, you know. And um, I, hope you have been, I hope you have been blessed. I hope we have learned um, wisdom from the things that KBAC had shared with us. Obviously, except the Lord builds the house, all those attempting to build, they do it in vain. It's only God that can actually raise somebody as king. Um, even Samuel taught Eliab, the first brother of David, had everything to be the king after Saul. But God said, no, God, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. It's only God that can pick. And it's obvious that um, KBSA had been divinely um, ordained to be the king over Ara. And if you ask me, sincerely speaking, um, he doesn't really need that, I need to do it because it's not, it's not about what um, he can gain from it. It's actually about what he's going to give. See him taking it up, like he had rightly said, as a ministry. And he actually really, I mean, registered the ministry to really make himself know that, yes, this is as unto the Lord. I'm doing this as a representative of God in the lives of the people of Ara. And sincerely speaking, I think the people of my town had. Um, they had seen hard days in their lives, and I think now is their time of joy. So we thank God for what God is doing in Ara. All right, so thank you everyone for joining us for this special edition of True It All um, with Call of Lubodi. We are coming back next Thursday by His Grace. Okay. Of course, if you are interested in getting uh, the book True It All, you can send a message to the number on the screen. And of course, you can always order your copy at that website, tia.com.ng. So definitely, as, unless Jesus Christ comes back, we will come your way again next Thursday as the Lord leaves. So thank you, everyone. Have a lovely evening.